Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from outside the European Parliament building in Brussels. Now, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, finally agreed her backstop deal with the European Commission, put it to the Westminster Parliament last month and had it flung back in her face for a record majority of 230 votes. Now she's trying to tweak that agreement, get agreement with the Commission, agreement with the Westminster Parliament, but even if she achieves that, there are two final hurdles to overcome. Firstly, a bundle of legislation which has still got to go through the Westminster Parliament. And secondly, any deal would have to be ratified by the European Parliament and the 751 members in the building behind me. Normally, they would ratify anything recommended by the Commission. But is patience finally running out with the UK in this Parliament building and the dying embers of this Parliament? We talk to MEPs who will know the answer. But first, back to the studio with Tasmina for your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. We've had a great response to the last in our series on Denmark. First, we hear from Susan, who says, Other small countries hear about. Brilliant show once again. Bravo to the Alex Salmon Show team. Thank you so much, Susan. Always kind as ever. Arthur says, Really worth seeing another Indian nation that Scotland could and should be. Teddy says, Another fantastic and informative programme. Thanks to Alex and all at Slanch. Dave says, we love the Danes, but they need to bring Borgen back. And so say all of us what a great series that was. Wendy Graham Gordon says, it looks like a place of hope. I would like to someday visit. Well, I hope you get the chance, Wendy. And finally, Gabriel says, art is amazing in the building. And of course, Gabriel's talking about the wonderful UN city in Copenhagen that Alex had the opportunity to have a look around in last week's show. And now for the first in a series of shows which presents Brexit, but from a European perspective. This week we hear from the British Brexiteers in Europe. Next week we hear from the European Remainers. But now back to Alex in Brussels. Uh, back in Brussels, I'm off to talk to Stephen Wolfe, once a UKIP MEP, now sitting as an independent in an excellent position to judge the state of the negotiations. Stephen Wolfe, uh, you're in a fantastic position to comment on the, the, the state of the, the Brexit burach, as we call it in Scotland. I mean, you're an independent member of the European Parliament now, no longer a member of UKIP. You can take an eye over what's happening. Yeah. So, Stephen, what is happening? Well, I think everyone will agree it's a mess. It's a real disaster in terms of geopolitics, the way that other countries are looking at Britain. It's an, a macro politics in the way that you're managing the government. But here in the European Parliament, it's the sense of being stunned by other MEPs and other countries about how a nation that they respect very deeply, who they've had a long historical connection with, and has been unable and incapable of projecting a very clear message to the European negotiators. So, so why is that? I mean, wh why have the last two years, from a British point of view, been so desultory and uh, ineffective in communicating what exactly the government wanted? I think it's because there wasn't any real desire by the establishment in London, be those the civil servants who had to keep the eye over the negotiations and the policy papers, the team that surrounded Theresa May, notwithstanding David Davis or Boris well, Johnson. I was going to Boris say David Davis. I mean, you think about David. An experienced European negotiator from True. time past, uh, an intelligent, affected, respected politician. He was the Brexit Secretary. Why wasn't David Davis able to impose some order in the chaos? Because I think behind him, people like Ollie Robbins and those who are in those teams were not on, on, on par with the deal. Ollie Robbins is a civil servant. Yes. This is the kind of uh, eminence grease of the negotiations, shadowy figure behind the scenes. That's right. Well, what has been the, the, the UK civil service objective then? Have, have they had a, a, a civil service objective out with the Conservative government objective? Well, there are those who've said there have, and there are those who've accused the civil service of being in cahoots with a kind of institutional Europe Europeanized intelligentsia, and that is, they've been used to 40 years of dealing with civil servants in the Commission, they can work out the deals amongst themselves, and politicians here have very little hand in how the rules and laws are made. So it suits them, it helps them, it's their own fiefdom in many ways. But do you think they were trying to reverse Brexit? I think they were trying to do two things. First of all, delay and deny Brexit and put it in such a position that Britain never actually left on paper. We still remain part of the customs union, single market, rules, regulations, so that in the future, another government would have it easy in being able to come back in. 
So in other words, they were trying to find some sort of halfway house where it would be easy to get back into the tent. That's right. If that's not mixing my, <laughs> my, my metaphors. So what about the Prime Minister in all of this? I, I mean, you know, David Davis might be circumvented by the civil service, but I mean, the Prime Minister is Prime Minister Paris. She, she should be able to dictate an agenda. Why hasn't Theresa May, who says mm. that she's a new-born Brexiteer, keeping faith with the referendum, keeping faith with the millions of votes for Brexit, why hasn't she been able to yeah, I, impose her will? Well, what I didn't think she understood is the power of the kind of patriarchal, patrician conservative parties who are truly behind Remain, those who are, who are backed like uh, the, the previous Prime Ministers, John Major and his team, to work behind the scenes to first of all oust her team, her close team, and they got rid of her chief of staff and her head of communications and replaced them with David Liddington and others who were deep Remainers. Then they attacked uh, David Davis, gave them a position where he had to resign, the same with Boris Johnson. And now she's trapped with the civil service, as I mentioned, who don't want to leave, create this situation where we can come in, and conservative Remainer politicians who are pushing her every day with project fear, concerns about our government, way that we look, so she, she no longer feels comfortable to be able to oppose it. And the only thing she's got is the belief in public service to maintain Brexit. Theresa May signed up to the deal that got rejected in a historic vote in the Westminster Parliament by 230 yeah. votes. The, the, the Parliament in Westminster is, at best on this issue, disputatious <laughs> and lacks coherence. Haven't they still got the, the, the governing hand? I mean, you know, it's not a great negotiating tactic to say, if you don't give us more, then we'll, we'll go hand in hand off the cliff. We have a Remainer parliament that is supported by Remainers in control of government policy effectively in the cabinet, with a Remainer sitting there as the head of the House in Mr Burko, controlling even those who have the right to submit amendments. In defence of the Speaker, I mean, I remember when John Burko was the toast of the Eurosceptics because he insisted on them getting their amendments heard, something that previous speakers hadn't done. Now, of course, they don't look upon him like that, but it's not so long ago where, no, I, where the Speaker insisting on minority views was uh, regarded as a good thing. And I think at that time most people were thinking, OK, we've got a balanced individual here, but certainly over the past few months with a man that still drives around in, in his so more wife's car with well, well, bollocks for Brexit well, well, on well, it. I think his and... wife's entitled to be uh, <laughs> before you know. uh, I mean, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my thoughts on this, are, Stephen, that, that, you know, 30 years off and on in the House of Commons, uh, I longed for a speaker who would uh, allow backbenchers and minorities to express their points of view. I saw so many speakers who were prisoners of the government in one channel. So I, I kind of like the idea of a, a speaker, whoever else might be said about him, is not in the pocket of the government. So, but leave that to one side. Yeah. Where do we go now, Steve? I mean, you know, we are in a position where, on your analysis, and I think, to be fair, on general analysis, whatever your view in this, uh, the UK has lost the first two years of negotiations. So, I mean, there's a, a, a few weeks to go. Can the position be recouped? Or, or is it going to be some unmanageable leap of faith into the unknown? We're now down to two options. Option one, which I think is going to be the one that probably comes out, is there will be tweaking to the backstop agreement, and I think they'll work to a system where they will have trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland through a borderless system, something that the European Union's had in place with other countries for years, and there's documents here on the back wall over there that shows exactly that. I think that's more likely. The, the situation that I would prefer, that would have given us, and still prefer, where we have strength over the European Union for the future trade ar arrangement is a World Trade Organization deal. I think that will be avoided at all costs by those in Parliament that will find some mechanism to stop it. The outcome that uh, you think is most likely, which is a, a kind of halfway house that satisfies yeah. no one, isn't there an argument from the Prime Minister's perspective that if she gets to that halfway house, then it leaves open to her successor and to future parliaments, they can either go the whole way or potentially, which you fear, come back into the house? Yeah, I, I, I would love to believe that our parliament would be filled with those who would have the sense of duty and responsibility to look at the opportunity that Brexit could give us in terms of our way of trading with other countries. I, I just don't feel that they have the wit about them to do that or the desire 
to be able to push forward Britain in a really energetic and uh, enthusiastic way. And I, I suspect that they'll just want to drift back into this in some way in the future. The Michel Barney's objective was to get a deal, and he succeeded in getting a deal with the UK government, if not the UK Parliament. But that was based on making sure that nobody could argue Absolutely. that a country exiting the European Union would have a beneficial relationship compared to a country which stayed in the European Union. So hasn't Michel Barnier, let's, let's be fair, hasn't he done his job? I think he's done his job in a number of ways. The first principle was exactly that, make sure everyone was frightened of wanting to leave. So that's their first issue. Secondly, he wanted to make sure that Brexit was delayed and denied to the extent that we couldn't compete against the European Union on different rules and different regulations because they knew that we could have a, a powerhouse on that. And the third, which is a really important thing when you hear about uh, people here and MEPs talk about the importance of geopolitics, the way that the European Union sent a message out to the world that, look, if we can hit the United Kingdom, the fifth largest economy, really hard in negotiations, then you can expect exactly the same with us in China. <laughs> so, so does that mean that one, not the only, but one of the likely consequences of Brexit is to make what's rest, the other 27, more coherent and certainly less likely to engage in the same process. I think what you're seeing now is the real swift uh, project to integrate even quick, more quickly than they anticipated. You can see that on the European Army, uh, the way that they've pushed not only through armaments, that the unification of uh, the designs of, of weaponry, to the creation of the PESCO and the structures in place, that's one. Two, to keep the negotiations strong with Turkey to keep them open. There's policy papers downstairs that says the same. Thirdly, the common central tax uh, issue, where they're already beginning to take the largest European countries as a common tax for the European Union. But see how they're actually pushing on Ireland to say, we're going to qualified majority now, you can't have a veto. So that will impact Ireland. So when the huge numbers of centralization is being pushed forward right now and very quickly. So what are the, the dying embers of this parliament? And who knows? Uh, Will the Brexit deal be done before these embers are extinguished? I hope it will. When you leave this place, will there be any aspect of a, a, a fond farewell? Or, or will you say, look, job done, next phase of my life? It's certainly going to be the next phase of my life. And there will be an element of, yes, job done. But surprisingly, I will miss some parts of it. Though there are a lot of really decent people in this place. I mean, one of the first things I did with my grandmother is always make sure you know the security guards, the cleaners, the cooks, people who provide us coffee. I'm, I'm going to miss all, all of them. I'm going to miss quite a lot of the members of the European Parliament. Since being independent, I've had much more engagement with them. I'm not going to miss the negativity that this place has. I'm not going to miss how insular it can be. And I'm not going to miss the fact that they... Should try Westminster sometime. Oh. <laughs> but there is a real... You know, kind of Brussels village feel, yeah, yeah. and they just don't tend to put their tentacles out to the rest of Europe, and they believe what they say matters more than anything else. I won't miss that, but I, w I do want to send a message to people out there and say that, look, they're just like any other large institution. They believe they're right, they believe their vision is right. It doesn't make all of them indecent people or nasty individuals. It just means that they have a different opinion to us, I just think their opinion is old, it's old-fashioned, it's in the past, not of the future. And we should still continue to engage with them and try and persuade them that there are different ways to engage with the world. Dean Wolfe, thank you so much. Now, for appearing to Alex Allen, you're entitled to the quay. The drill is whiskey in the quay, yeah. only scotch, no Mancunian <laughs> impersonation, <laughs> and then pass round your, your many friends to wish them health. Well, thank you, Alex. I'm going to really enjoy that and pass around. As long as it doesn't mean I have to kiss you now, that's it. They're great. <laughs> well. Thank you very much. Cheers I appreciate it. It's really very kind of you. And whatever you do now, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back. This week, the Prime Minister asked for more time for her Brexit deal yet again. But is time finally running out? These were the increasingly testy Commons exchanges on Tuesday. I urge all members across this House to think about the damage the Prime Minister's strategy is doing. The threat to industry and skilled jobs and communities all across this country. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's deal is a fraud. Ending freedom of movement, leaving the biggest trading bloc in the world, this will be catastrophic for Scotland. The UK is already suffering the cost of Brexit. Will the Prime Minister put an end to this economic madness? The Prime Minister 
not only is kicking the can down the road yet again, she again refuses to take no deal off the table. In the statement the Prime Minister has given today and the lack of concrete progress, it feels as if the Prime Minister is purposefully making Parliament hit its head against a brick wall in the hope that when we stop we might feel better. Is the EU policy uh, on the backstop like that great Eagles song, Hotel California? You can check out any time you like, but you can't leave. <laughs> Not much sign of cross-party agreement there, then. Nor was there an exchange of letters between the party leaders, with even doubts online as to whether this was the Prime Minister's own signature. The talks continue, but Big Ben, well, she is a ticking. Meanwhile in Strasbourg, where the European Parliament is sitting this week, some MEPs are sensing a new political opportunity if Theresa May eventually tries to extend the deadline for Brexit. Alex speaks to Nathan Gill, one-time leader of UKIP in Wales, but now one of the independent MEPs pledged to join Nigel Farage in a new Brexit party. Is there any backsliding on the B-Day, the day of leaving the European Union on the 29th of March? Let's see. Nathan Gill, thank you for joining us from the uh, European Parliament. You're welcome. Now, can you explain first, I mean, UKIP has lost three quarters of its members, its European Parliament members. Why is that? Is it because, having achieved the result in the referendum, UKIP lost its way, or is it the drift to the right that we've seen in the leadership of the party has been the key reason for the defections? I think there's a, definitely a factor of when our, um, you know, the, the reason why we existed, the, the referendum, and we won it and we got Brexit, that a lot of people felt, well, there we are, job done, and a lot of people did go off to back, back to the parties that they'd belonged to beforehand. But I think when, it, when you're looking at the MEPs and why we went independent, um, it, it's probably a very different reason. And that was because the way that the party started to, to change. And it started to be, become an almost resemble what we'd spent years telling people that we were not. And so, I mean, I was quite adamant that I never left UKIP, UKIP left me. The party that I joined no longer existed. They were banging the drum about, you know, the Muslimification of Britain, about Islam. That's not why I got into politics and I didn't want to be associated with that. Now, sitting now as an independent member of the European Parliament, you seem to sense a political opportunity if the Prime Minister tries to delay Brexit and then there's more European Parliament elections in the UK where Nigel Farage has formed the Brexit party and you've said this week that you'll be one of its adherents. Yes, absolutely. But I, I don't think it's a political opportunity as such because that makes it sound almost like it's something that we want to do and it's a way of us keeping ourselves in a job and keeping ourselves as politicians. But we said all along we were only in this to get a result. And the reason why Nigel and other people as well have um, began to, to form this Brexit party and designate as Brexit is that we, we actually don't want to have to use it. It's almost like you've got a nuclear bomb, but you don't actually want to use it. You're hoping that the threat of the bomb is enough to get what you want. And the Brexit party is there to try and ensure that the Brexiteers get what we wanted, and we wanted a proper full Brexit. We don't want to be left in the EU, we don't want to be in a customs union or a single market or closely aligned or any of these things. We wanted our independence, we wanted our freedom to choose and we wanted to be able to say wholeheartedly, job done, we've left the EU. And Theresa's May deal is atrocious and isn't going to do that. The fact that they're talking about extending Article 50, that to us is quite atrocious as well. So we need politicians to know if you decide to go down that route, there will be consequences. And the best way to, um, to affect politicians is at the ballot box. And we know full well as a Brexit party that we will do incredibly well if there is another European election. So if they want to avoid that, we're saying very clearly, we, you know, we don't particularly want to have to do this, but if we must, we will. But if you want to avoid that, just deliver what you said you were going to deliver in your manifestos. So can we be quite clear, is this new Brexit party contingent on Theresa May delaying B-Day on the 29th of March, or would it happen anyway if she tries to water down Brexit? So, in a way, the, it's almost like a, a Brexit party backstop. 
So what we're saying is, if she delays Britain leaving the European Union on the 29th of March, and therefore we feel quite strongly if that happens, then we are heading towards another European election, then the party will, will spring into full effect and we will, will bring down um, the full weight of Brexiteers upon the government and they will have to pay at the ballot box for what they have done. If, for example, she's able to turn round her historic uh, 230 vote defeat in the House of Commons and somehow cobble together a parliamentary majority for her deal, the Barney May deal, the one that was rejected by the Commons, if that happens, you might not like it, but there wouldn't be a European election for the Brexit party to stand in. So what would you do then? That's correct, and I think that's when Nigel will have to make his decision about what the next step is for the Brexit party. Unlikely as it seems, Theresa May is actually successful in piloting her view and her deal, or something like it, through the, the House of Commons, which wouldn't be the Brexit you wanted. If you had known the outcome mm -hmm. before the referendum of, uh, of 2016, it, would you have gone ahead with the Brexit project if we have to end up with what you would regard as Theresa May's halfway house? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. Would I have gone ahead with it? Well, I think I would, because what we've proven in principle, Alex, is that actually the British people wanted wanted this severance, wanted us to leave the EU. How we actually go about it, the mechanism, that's the next big battle. So in a way, if you think about it, we've won the battle of France, we're now fighting the battle for Britain, aren't we? Now, Nathan Gill, if uh, this new party is formed and if it finds a political opportunity, if not in the European elections, if they don't happen, then somewhere else, how are you going to avoid the, the schisms and the fracturing that has beset UKIP over the, the last few years? Well, we've learned a lot of lessons from being members of UKIP and being, being heavily involved in the political party. And I think the biggest problem we had was from entryists, from people who came in for their own ends because they thought that they were God's gift to UKIP and aren't we lucky that we're joining your party and we're now going to stand for you in an election when we'd never seen these people before. And we had an NEC that was an absolute disaster, which actually is one of the big factors as to why Nigel resigned his leadership of UKIP because he just couldn't bear to be dealing with these these people any longer and I was I witnessed several of these horrendous NEC meetings in which they forced Neil Hamilton on us in Wales against the wishes of the actual membership in Wales so how do we avoid it well we're going to this new party is going to be extremely businesslike it's going to be set up very much like a company where the leader of the party will create a board the board will have full power. They will be able to ensure that the party goes in the direction that they want it to go. If the party fails, it'll be down to the board and the leader, because the leader picked that board. It won't be down to infighting and people saying stupid things on the television that they shouldn't and all of the other things that we had to deal with with, with UKIP. So discipline will be extremely important. And as Nigel has said um, on his um, Facebook page, dissidents need not apply. Well, it sounds uh, very businesslike, but if I may, it doesn't sound very democratic. Well, I mean, you may, you may say that, but quite frankly, the political party is there to attract people who um, agree with the aims of that party so that the party can fulfil it. If we spend the next 20 years fighting amongst ourselves, well, what's the point of that? Because we'll never achieve what we want to achieve. And so, quite frankly, what we've said very clearly and what Nigel has said is this party will be there to, to be a sword of Damocles over the government, over the Conservative Party. We will trigger it if we must. If they fail, we will then trigger it and heaven help them because, as I say, we've already had 66,000 people sign up to the party in the space of three days. So the will is out there. Is it democratic? Well. I mean, what is democracy? People, people, when people vote in a democracy, you put your eggs in the box and then that's it. You then leave the leaders to decide what to do after you voted for them. And the party will be no different. People will let them, will put their eggs in the box by joining the party or associating with the party. And then they will leave it to the leader and who he chooses to actually make sure that the goals of the party are achieved.
Nathan Gill, one, one final question. You've got the fairly magnificent surroundings of the European Parliament behind you. Is there anything at all that you'll miss about that assembly if, uh, if you come to leave it and are not standing for the, the new party in the European elections? Is there anything you'll miss uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the Brussels Parliament and, uh, and the European perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's been, um, when I got elected, I actually said to my wife, I've been handed a front row seat to history. And it's true. I mean, we see presidents, we see prime ministers here, we've seen the Pope. Um, you get to come to Strasbourg, which is a beautiful city. You're in the heart of Europe. You know, we love Europe. It's just the EU that we're not very fond of. The food's great. The weather's usually really nice. We've made lots of friends here. It's been a big part of my life, Alex. And whenever a chapter closes, it is kind of sad, regardless of what was involved in that chapter. But what I'm looking forward to wholeheartedly is opening up a new chapter in my life. And hopefully, politics will not be a part of that, because hopefully, we will have achieved what we set out to achieve. Well, Nathan Gill, with that generous tribute to Europe, thank you so much for appearing in the Alex Salmon Show. You're welcome. And so these home thoughts from Europe, whether it be from Brussels or Strasbourg, are hardly good news for the Prime Minister. The architects of Brexit believe she has botched it. Stephen Wolfe blames the Remainers and the establishment. While the response to the anticipated Brexit betrayal, Nathan Gill prepares to join Nigel Farage in a new party. Meanwhile, Theresa May is involved not just in an exchange of barbs of Jeremy Corbyn, but an exchange of letters. But the cross-party initiative just ended up cross. What we have here is not so much the emergence of a House of Commons consensus, but an elaborate game of political pass-the-parcel, with each leader preparing to blame the other when the music finally stops. But whoever is greatly to blame, surely it's grave news for the country. In the current balanced parliament, there are few convincing majorities for anything. However, at least two-thirds of the MPs think that a no-deal Brexit represents a bad deal for Britain with the gravest of economic consequences. However, it's by no means clear they can agree to force the government's hands by legislation to prevent this. The prospect of the leaders of the two great parties preparing the ground for blaming each other for a fiasco is hardly reassuring. Whatever else may be said about Brexit Britain, it is proving no ode to joy. And so from Tasmina myself and all at the show, it's Abiento. 